Inflation has been a key area of interest for economists and the general public for the past two years now because unlike a lot of other abstract economic processes, it has a real tangible impact on the way that we live our lives. Sustained inflation has been caused by a combination of increased consumer demand, thanks to low interest rates and high levels of government spending, supply chain troubles, and good old fashioned profit maximisation from companies who have been able to raise their prices under the guise of keeping up with inflation that they are directly causing by raising their prices. Unlike other economic problems where if you do manage to keep your job you will probably be fine, inflation is uniquely hard to avoid and impacts those who can least afford it most severely. Now we've been covering the issue of inflation on this channel since the first factory started closing down and stimulus checks started rolling out, which as scary as it is to think about was almost three years ago now. During that time there have been hundreds of conflicting stories about inflation from news outlets, governments and central banks all around the world that have varied over time from inflation is not a problem to inflation is just transitory to inflation is becoming the primary economic focus of these institutions. But with inflation, as with all things, what goes up must come down. And now that curbing inflation has become the number one priority of different governments around the world, it should only be a matter of time before living expenses for regular people aren't spiralling out of control. But it also might not be that easy, and there are factors outside of government control that can keep prices stubbornly high even with drastic intervention. Understanding the ways that inflation can get back to a healthy level can teach us a lot about how to properly manage an economy and what can go wrong if we don't. So what are the economic forces to look out for that are going to help economies reduce prices? What are the economic forces that governments and central banks are going to have to fight against because they're pushing prices upwards? And finally, can we expect prices to actually fall on everyday items to bring them back in line with the levels that we are experiencing before these economic disruptions? Or is this the new normal and we should just be happy with prices not increasing further? This episode of Economics Explained was brought to you by today's sponsor, Rocket Money, formerly Truebill. I'm currently in the process of looking for a new home and when I went to apply for a mortgage, I was shocked to find out that the bank was paying closer attention to my spending habits than I was. I was spending hundreds of dollars every month on subscriptions that I never use and consistently going over the budgets that I set for myself. Fortunately, Rocket Money has made getting my act together a lot easier. Rocket Money is an all-in-one finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. This personal finance app allows you to manage subscriptions, lower bills, build a custom budget and grow your savings all in one place. While looking for a new place to call home, I have used Rocket Money to cancel dozens of unwanted subscriptions, set a better budget and even track my net worth. To save more and spend less, join the 3.4 million members using Rocket Money. Go to rocketmoney.com slash economics explained or by clicking the link in the description to get started for free or unlock even more features with premium. That's rocketmoney.com slash economics explained to get started for free. About two weeks ago now, Philip Lowe, the governor of the Reserve Bank here in Australia, did something unprecedented. He apologised. The reason for his apology was that in early 2021, he made an announcement that he would not raise record low interest rates until at least 2024. This caused many Australians to feel confident in taking on new mortgages or extending the ones that they already had, because even very large debt loads could be managed when they were spread out over 30 years with a very low interest payment attached to them. Since the announcement, the Australian Reserve Bank has increased the cash rate eight times, to a level almost double what it was before the lockdowns and trade problems of 2020. This has meant that a lot of Australians are now experiencing mortgage stress because they are paying rates triple what they were two years ago on mortgages that have ballooned to record sizes over the course of the pandemic. Now, in defence of the Australian Reserve Bank, that announcement was made with the caveat that they would not raise interest rates unless inflation became a problem, which at the time they genuinely weren't expecting. Of course, nobody ever listens to boring conditions. They just heard cheap money and they convinced themselves that they were going to be real estate millionaires. And we also know now that inflation did turn out to be a serious issue. Now central banks aren't dumb. They did realise that their low interest rates combined with record levels of government stimulus would cause inflation, but they thought so long as it was carefully managed, this could actually be a good thing. Inflation itself has a stimulating effect on the economy. If people see that their money is buying less and less every year, they will be more inclined to either invest their money to make returns that can beat inflation, or make consumer purchases now rather than putting it off for when inflation has had a chance to increase prices. You can probably see this process playing out on a personal level. I know I made a few big purchases in 2020 because I could see inflation coming. And I'm willing to admit I probably justified some dumb purchases to myself between now and then because there is no point having too much cash with inflation so high and interest rates so low. 
If you didn't fall into this way of thinking, you're a much more disciplined person than I am. But most people did, and on aggregate this increases consumer and investor spending in an economy. Early on in the pandemic, inflation was particularly focused at asset markets, and markets that people had convinced themselves were assets. After an early dip caused by fear and uncertainty, stocks began to rise to all-time highs fueled by low borrowing rates and people dropping stimulus checks into the market for the first time. Alternative markets like cryptocurrencies, Pokemon cards and luxury goods also took off as people either wanted to flex their newfound wealth or speculate with it. This is still inflation. Inflation is simply the increasing price level of goods and services in the economy. But it's not the type of inflation we typically pay attention to because stocks, cryptocurrencies, collectibles and even real estate is not directly included in the consumer price index, which is typically how headline inflation is measured. If price inflation was contained to these markets, it probably wouldn't have been a huge deal for the broader economy. It would have increased inequality because richer people are the ones that stand to benefit the most from the increasing value of investments because they own the most investments. This would look bad in Gini coefficient figures, but it wouldn't actually hurt the quality of life of average participants in the economy because someone else getting richer doesn't mean that they are getting poorer. The real problem started when prices started rapidly increasing on non-speculative essentials like food, energy and rent. There were many reasons why this happened. The spark for things like food and general consumer items was the supply chain difficulties caused by lockdowns, shipping container shortages and changes in the global merchant marine fleet. The spark for things like energy was the invasion of Ukraine in combination with the same shipping difficulties, and the spark for rent was the appreciation in the value of real estate assets in most countries around the world, which was passed along from landlords to tenants. But a spark is no good without fuel, and that was provided by the trillions of extra dollars in people's pockets, which meant that they could afford to pay a little bit extra to eat out or buy an expensive car with a dealer markup that would guzzle very expensive fuel. If people could afford to pay and they were still willing to do so, prices would continue to rise. What's more is that so long as this status quo remained, there was no market mechanism for prices to fall. A lot of the initial driving forces behind price increases in the economy are no longer present. The cost of shipping items around the world did peak, but it has now fallen back to reasonable levels. What's more is that retailers are now holding on to an abundance of stock because they have over-ordered items earlier in the year in an attempt to keep their shelves full, which means that they are now receiving items faster than they can move them. This is known as an inventory bullwhip and it's hurting businesses who are in some cases needing to rent out additional warehouse space just to store their inventory. The soaring home values that push rental prices up initially are also on their way down in most major real estate markets around the world. But despite lower shipping costs, supply abundance and correcting housing markets, consumer prices and rents haven't fallen because companies and landlords are still able to charge these prices and people are still willing to pay them. There is an element of sticky pricing in this process. Sticky pricing is the delay in certain items changing their price to reflect market forces. Some prices are very unsticky. Things like shares traded on a securities exchange change prices every single second as they react to different levels of supply and demand. But things like rents in particular are normally negotiated on six month or year long contracts, so it naturally takes a certain amount of time to react to outside market forces. Consumer items like groceries, subscriptions and everything else that you buy in a given month fall somewhere in between these two extremes on the price stickiness spectrum. This has meant that companies have decided to keep prices high and make record profits, and rent still remains an issue for those not fortunate enough to own their own home. This is what forced central banks around the world to start raising their interest rates earlier this year. Raising interest rates means households and businesses will spend a larger portion of their income on interest payments, which means that they will have less money left over to spend on everything else. This combined with the tapering of government support packages means that there is less money flowing around the economy to sustain high prices, especially after considering that a lot of the supply side issues we were experiencing at the beginning of the year, like shipping costs and stock levels, are starting to work themselves out. So increased supply of goods and services with a reduction in demand should mean that prices fall. The only problem is, prices haven't fallen yet. The same kind of sticky pricing that slowed down the onset of inflation will also slow down how quickly prices return to normal. Prices also tend to take longer for businesses and landlords to adjust downwards than they do upwards, unless there is strong competition in their markets, which at the moment there isn't. What's more is that despite interest rates being high and government support programs being far less generous than they were in the first two years of the pandemic, employment has remained very strong. So people are still earning enough money to afford expensive goods and services. But that might be starting to change. Everything we've explored so far has had some amount of lag from when changes happen to when the effects of those changes are actually felt. 
When the world first went into lockdown, it took a while for markets to dip and unemployment to spike, despite being an unprecedented shakeup of our modern global economy. When interest rates were dropped and government stimulus was rolled out, it took a while for things to recover, and it took a little while longer for inflation to take hold in highly liquid markets like stocks and other speculative assets. And then finally, a lot longer for inflation to take hold in markets that we actually pay attention to, as in the ones that are measured using the consumer price index. Now that interest rates have been increased, we are seeing a very similar pattern, but in reverse. Liquid assets, like very active markets, have fallen drastically this year, particularly those that represent companies that relied heavily on cheap credit. Other speculative markets, like cryptocurrencies, have done exactly the same thing. And even status items that people bought to show off how wealthy they are have seen massive price reductions over the past year. Now, nobody can predict the future, least of all economists. But this pattern would suggest that the next items in line to fall in price are regular consumer goods. There might be outliers, like energy, depending on how the situation in Ukraine evolves. But in aggregate, the things putting upwards pressure on prices are now being outweighed by the forces pushing prices down. The holiday season will be very important to watch because it is when household discretionary spending normally peaks, as people are buying gifts, hosting parties, going on holidays and treating themselves. If economies can get through this season and maintain a solid level of employment while also continuing the trend of falling prices, then we have a good reason to be optimistic. I know being optimistic doesn't attract as much attention as stories about how the world is going to end here on YouTube. I should know. My most popular video ever was literally about a study predicting that society is 18 years away from total collapse, but I think it's important to recognise when things are going right. Just like the governor of the Australian Reserve Bank didn't see inflation getting so bad so quickly, I personally didn't see it getting itself fixed so quickly. So, following his example, I think it's important to set the record straight so that everybody has a better idea of what is going on in the economies around them. So, thanks for watching, mate. Bye.